I already mentioned during the kind of the offering communion time that this is, no, it's, it's a difficult message. I don't want to preach it. You know, I, I wish God gave us like, hey, there, you know, there's three passages of scripture that you can pull out of the Bible and they're no longer relevant to you. Wouldn't that be awesome? Just, we'll just X that part out. Don't want to have to deal with that one. And this is one of them. The, how we live with others. How do we engage other people? Even more than that, what do we do when someone hurts us? When someone offends us? And we have this predisposition to being offended, don't we? Just get on the freeway, right? <laughs> uh, why does no one know how to drive in California? I don't even, I don't get it. But we, we have this natural predisposition to be offended. And sometimes it can be embarrassing. What our lives produce in a moment of offense can be incredibly embarrassing. I hope I'm not the only person that that's the case for. So, so much so that just this past Monday, what started as an offense turned into a moment of embarrassment for me. No one knows this story. No one's heard this story. Just happened on Monday. I was going to keep it as this little quiet secret, but I'll go ahead and tell you that your pastor sometimes uh, doesn't always handle offenses very well. Monday at the Converge Center, I'm there by myself. Usually on Mondays, it's an appointment only kind of day. And and so I'm there in my office working on this message, a message about forgiving other people. I'm in my office, eyeball deep in God's word. And, and we, we're next to a music studio. Uh, and, and, and Ed and Kim will tell you, and I, that music studio drives me crazy sometimes, especially where Ed and Karen are at. Here's the thing, like there's like there can be like three different classes going at once. So you hear three different pianos and then drums over here and I'll walk out of my office and I'll say, "Oh my goodness, that drives me crazy." And you know me, I love music. But hearing three different lessons going on at once sometimes can be a little bit unnerving. And so and then and then about three or four times a week there's someone who's got to be one of the teachers. One of the teachers comes in a little bit early and he sits at the piano and he plays the hardest and loudest piano playing that you can imagine. He is incre- He's very good, very gifted, but when he plays, it's like triple as loud. And I usually walk out of my office and I tell, I tell Alexa to play something so that we can drown it out. But on Monday, I was sitting in my office, and there was no other noise, so it was especially quiet because I needed the quietness so that I could really hear from God's Spirit, and he started playing. So I did what any, any God-fearing person would have done. I, I went, and I, I grabbed the biggest speaker that I could find in the Converge Center. I plugged it in at Ed's desk, and I put heavy metal music on blaring into their wall. And then, and then I walked back to my office, pretty proud of myself, sat down, and I'm looking at my forgiveness message. <laughs> and so I tucked my tail between my legs, and I went back to, my, to Ed's desk, and I unplugged it. Thankfully, it only went about 45 seconds, but it was a reminder to me that we have this propensity for revenge, don't we? We're hardwired to be like, you can't do that to me. There's a show called Neighbor Wars. There's a show that's dedicated to people one-upping each other in a revenge, a show called Parking Wars. You take my parking spot, so I block you in, and we're wired for revenge. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, a passage of scripture that we have to come to terms with. Here's what it says. I wish I could read verse 14 and skip verse 15, but I'll read them both. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you, period. I like that. I can vibe with that, Jesus. But Jesus says, if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Ugh. I don't want to hear that part. I don't want to hear that part. So what does that mean, Dustin? Does that mean we, if we don't forgive that we don't get to get into heaven? No, it's not saying that. Does this mean that getting to heaven is, is, is an exercise in me earning it through forgiving others? No, it's not saying that. There's a parallel passage of scripture where Jesus unpacks it a little bit more in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to spend most of our time in Matthew chapter 18. But Matthew chapter 6 is important. 
Because Jesus is, is nodding at this thing. He just, he just showed us how to pray, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer. And a part of that Lord's Prayer is, forgive us our sins, what? As we forgive, according to the way that we forgive, like unto the way that we forgive. Jesus says that, and then he says it, he prays it, and then the very next passage of scripture, he doubles down on it. And he says, I meant what I said. I meant what I prayed. If you forgive others, you'll be forgiven. But if you don't learn how to forgive others, you won't be forgiven. And Jesus kind of doubles down on that. And then he says it again in Matthew chapter 18 in this parallel passage of scripture, which says to me and you, this matter, if Jesus is going to say something three times in his short ministry, this is important to him. Amen. Matthew chapter 18. I want to read it. The, the very first word in verse 21, it says, what's the, what, what's that word? The first one, you know, me, I like to just point these kinds of things out because this is, this is saying to us, there's something happening just before this. So then is, is, is one, another way of saying, therefore, and so we want to know what's happening just before this. Just before this, I, I'm not even going to read it to you because I'll be tempted to preach it, and I don't want to. I, don't, I, don't, I, got, I got too much content as it is. But in Matthew chapter 18, just before these verses, Jesus lays out how do we navigate conflict within the church. And maybe you're familiar with a passage of scripture where he says, first, just you by yourself, go to your brother or sister, then you take somebody with you. It's, it's helping us navigate conflict when someone wrongs you or is doing something contrary to, to what God would have for them or for the community. Jesus lays it out. And so that he had just done that, and now Peter is going to ask him a question, which gets me thinking, maybe Peter had a conflict in his own life that he was working through, and so now he's trying to see, okay, how does this work in my life? But Peter asks Jesus a follow-up question to Jesus saying, here's how you deal with conflict within the body of Christ. So Peter then says, we're well, just after that, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Peter would have felt good about saying seven times because rabbis of this time, the majority of them were teaching that forgiveness is a thrice effort, that you forgive three times. Somebody wrongs you, forgive them. They do it again, forgive them. They do it again, forgive them. They do it again, don't worry about it, write them off. That was kind of the modern day teaching. So Peter, he, he looks at Jesus and he's like, you are more spiritual and gracious than, than those. So we'll double it plus one. Maybe that's why he said seven times. Maybe he was referring back to a, a passage in Genesis chapter four about revenge. Maybe that's why he references it. Maybe Peter's thinking seven is the number of completion. So once you forgive someone seven times, that process is completed but we know what Jesus says. Jesus says, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. Can you imagine Peter like, down, dog. Maybe Peter would say to Jesus like, Jesus, I, I can't keep track of that. To which Jesus would go, exactly. You know, foreshadowing in, in essence what later Paul would write to the church in Corinth, that love keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus is making a statement. Maybe your Bible says 77 times or 70 times 7. Either way, what Jesus is saying is we're not keeping score. And he goes on and he then tells a story. He says in verse 23, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars, biblical time millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. This sounds familiar. Be patient with me and I will pay it. He pleaded, but his creditor, who was just forgiven millions of dollars, wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. So they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. 
Snitches get stitches, folks. I don't know why you guys did that, but verse 32. Then the king called in the man who he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? That's going to be sort of the centerpiece of today. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Verse 34, then the angry king, ooh, his posture's changed. The angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Verse 35, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to Pretend like you forgive, even though you really still want to punch them in the throat. <laughs> forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Let's pray. God, I pray that your word this morning and, and the way that, Father, I, I've, I've sat with open arms and God and tried to bring an open heart to you, asking that you would uh, reveal your word through this very broken man. Um, I, I pray that... God, you would, you would just draw us all towards a deeper understanding. I think it's a twofold message that I ask that you would deepen our understanding, deepen the way we, we are able to perceive two things. First, what you've done for us. And secondly, how what you've done for us should change us and shape us in how we love and what we do for others. So I, I pray that you would reveal that today to us in a deeper uh, God, more, uh, just, the, it's an outward way. that the, the way we know your love for us would become an outward expression to those around us. That, that, that's what the world needs. Um, I prayed it, God, with our teams this morning back in the back, all that your church would be marked as a place of compassion and grace and a safe place rather than a place where people expect to be yelled at and screamed at or judged. And so we just pray, God, that you would use our community to uh, be that place for this city. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. It's one of those words that can be triggering. It can just instantly cause us to feel some things. Questions surface, like there's four questions that it's going, they're going to be difficult questions and I'm not looking for answers. There's no show of hands, but who's been the hardest person in your life to forgive? You think about that journey and that process and the gut-wrenching things that's been attached to you trying to forgive that spouse or that parent or that person that was supposed to be safe as you were growing up but ultimately just left you with mounds of trauma that you're still sorting through as an adult. Who has been the hardest person in your life to forgive or who have you needed forgiveness from? Who do you even currently now need forgiveness from? For, fourthly, maybe this question, is there someone in your world right now that you know that you're not living at peace with? And, and what, when we start to think about these questions, it, it just brings, they're not easy answers. They're difficult answers. And, and Jesus, three different times in just a few passages, he says, this is important stuff. And the way you, we, we respond to these kinds of questions is directly attached to the way we understand and receive forgiveness and acceptance from God. These are hard questions, and we already, we already said it. Life is full of opportunities to take offense. And so what do we do when life is constantly throwing up ways and reasons for us to take offense? Sometimes in our life, they are huge and weighty and heavy and sometimes they're stupid and pointless and yet we react to them by sticking a speaker on someone's desk and blaring music on the other side of the wall. Why? What are we supposed to do when life throws us those things? Jesus gives a very simple one word answer, but it's not simple to learn and to master the art of and that is to forgive. Somebody say forgive. Forgive. What do we do with the host of offenses that our life seems to constantly Produce. Well, a Puritan preacher by the name of Thomas Watson, he defined forgiveness like this. Forgiveness is striving against all thoughts of revenge when we will not do our enemies mischief but wish well to them. We will grieve at their calamities. We will pray for them. We will seek reconciliation with them, and we will show ourselves ready on all occasions to relieve them. Forgiveness. What, what a work. 
What a difficult expectation to forgive. We're going to talk today about forgiveness through the lens of what Jesus has already said, but it feels like it's a responsible work of, for me to do, an important work for me to do, to start with some things, what forgiveness is not. Because if forgiveness is going to be potentially triggering, we should spend some time disarming some of those emotional triggers. Let, let me tell you what forgiveness is not very quickly. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not synonymous with forgetting. And because you remember, you, you can't do the work of forgiveness. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not being okay with someone who continues to hurt you. Forgiveness is not an absence of boundaries. Forgiveness is not having no expectations for better behavior. Forgiveness is not keeping silent about your own needs. It's not instant trust if trust has been broken. Forgiveness is not an absence of anger and hurt and fear because you feel things and you feel things deeply and maybe because you're moved and you're frustrated or you're angry or when you think about it, you, you, your heart breaks and you cry. That doesn't mean that the, the work of forgiveness can't, can't come into your life. And finally, forgiveness is not an absence of consequences. Saying I forgive you or doing the work of forgiveness is not a get out of jail free card. If I had to give a working, practical definition for our time together today on forgiveness, it would be this, a releasing of my right to hold an offense against someone else. And that's, I know that sounds like a simple, boiled down definition, but the important part of this is that who's the only person that we're doing a work on if this is our definition of forgiveness? Me. The only work of forgiveness I want to talk to you about today is in, in you and in me. Forgiveness is me making a decision about what I've understood to be true in my life and what the work of Christ means to me and how that changes me from the inside out. Forgiveness is a releasing of my right to hold an offense against someone else. Two questions kind of surfaced to the top as I was preparing this message. First, what in the world would motivate me to forgive like this? You know, what? This is so counterintuitive. It's so counter our wiring. What in the world would motivate me to forgive like this? And then the second question that kind of comes to the surface, even if I could be motivated and I found motivation, how in the world would I ever be able to do it? I believe Jesus answers that for us in the text that we just read. I want to go through verse by verse by verse, Matthew 18, 23 to the end, and see if what we can learn today about forgiveness, how this applies to us. I'll do my best to do it quickly, but there's a lot here. Let's begin in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 18. It starts with this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. We're going to start there, and we're going to kind of set the stage with two observations. The first observation is that Jesus is saying this is, a, this is an, an illustration between God and and us, that the king is, in this passage of scripture, is compared to the king, the kingdom earthly is compared to the kingdom of heaven. And so God is the king here in this illustration, and you and I are the, that initial servant that owes a great debt to a king. And so we have to set that baseline. This is a story about our relationship to our king and the debt that we have established between us and him. And the second thing that we need to notice, and, and I could spend the whole message just on this point as it was a sense of urgent it was an urgent reminder for me and that is that because he's a good king and he cares about his kingdom he has to do good accounting he can't ignore debts he's got to settle the debts he a good king is not going to be just flippant about millions of dollars that's owed to the kingdom and so there will be an accounting there will be a score that is settled there will be a cosmic size day of reckoning where we've got to 
even now in this moment, be reminded that this life that we can get lulled into thinking that this is the whole story and it's just about amassing some kind of comfortable way of life and some kind of nice marriage and then maybe someday a retirement. And we think that's the sum of the best that life has to offer. Friend, I, I went back to a book that I haven't read in a long, long time. Maybe you're familiar with it. C.S. Lewis's, uh, the, the, uh, what's, what is it called? Um, Screw Tape Letters. That book, Screw Tape Letters, where it's about the kingdom of hell disrupting the work of believers. There's such an interesting, pulling out of that book, it says this, indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, and without signposts. There will be a reckoning someday, but friend, you might be here today and Convince yourself that all you got to do is get through life, but our king is going to call due the debts that we have. Verse 23 reminds us of that. So now that we've established those two things, this is a story between me and God, and the very first thing we got to see is that a king's got to make his accounts right. Verse 24, so in the process of that, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars, and he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Millions of dollars in Bible times. Maybe you're reading a version of scripture that says it was 10,000 talents. Well, that, that reading it through the lens of 10,000 talents can actually help us give a modern day figure to how much money that this is. One talent was equal to 20 years wages. One talent is equal to 20 years wages. So the median income across America is just under $60,000. That does not account for California gas prices though, for sure. $60,000 a year times 20 years gives us one talent and that's $1.2 million. But this guy didn't know one talent. He owed 10,000 talents, which should be $1.2 million in our modern day way of thinking times 10,000 and talents equals $12 billion. I know y'all are working through some credit card debt, but you can feel good about your debt compared to this guy's debt. Crazy. You got to work really hard to amass that kind of debt. But remember what we learned, our first observation of the day, is that God is saying this is the kind of debt that you and I have established between us and our king. And when I say that you, you, owe bill, you, you have synonymously a billion, billions of dollars of debt between you and God, a, a sin debt based upon the, the decisions that we've made, the things that we've done, the words that we've said. And if I say you have a billion sized debt between you and God, it'll be an interesting question to say, how does that land with you? Does it land like, yeah, you ain't lying, bro. It, uh, you have no idea. Mine's probably, mine's like national debt size, trillions and trillions of dollars. Or maybe, maybe you're like, oh, I, don't, I mean, yeah, there's some billion debt people in here, but I'm only in the five or six digit range. I'm a pretty good person. I've made some pretty good choices. And maybe you don't realize the actual, what your, what your debt has actually done. And let me tell you this, the very first observation that I don't want you to forget, this, we're going to come back to this a couple times. How you see yourself as a debtor is directly proportional to who you are as a forgiver. And so if you're like, oh, well, I'm not that bad. I, I, I've, I've done everything the right way. You're going to begin to hold people hostage to doing everything the right way. How we are, how you see yourself as a debtor is directly proportional to who you are as a forgiver. In his book, A Heart for God, there's a Scottish theologian by the name of Sinclair Ferguson. Here's what he said. I mean, it's one of those passages you'd have to read a couple times to really absorb it. But he said, God's holiness means that he is separate from sin. But holiness in God also means his wholeness, that he is complete. He lacks nothing. God's holiness is his godness. It is his being God and all that it means for him to be God. To meet God in his holiness, therefore, is to be altogether overwhelmed by the discovery that he is God and not man. There's this sense of awe and wonder as Sinclair Ferguson writes this. And the reason I read it to you is that we need to understand he is so other than us. And if we're ever going to have a relationship with him, 
our brokenness has to be made whole. That's why 1 Peter says this, you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. There's a debt that must be satisfied if we're ever going to have a relationship with a holy and a perfect God and us recognizing just the sheer weightiness of that debt makes all of the difference in how we see the debts of those around us. I wrote this down, because of his perfect nature, God is required by the standard of himself to keep a perfect account, for any other kind of accounting would be imperfect and therefore not God. He has to call me, call my sins due if I'm ever going to have a relationship with him. You and I stood here today and we sang, how great is our God, and Maybe, maybe you felt the emotion or just that connection. I don't know what it feels like for you when you're in the presence of God. And it's just, but I, I do, I feel a connection. It's usually either, you know, sometimes it is this Holy Spirit goosebumps. It's usually for me, this physiological feeling I feel in my stomach and, and that connection that I feel with God, that would never happen if my debt wasn't satisfied. Revelation 20, 12 tells us that every single deed that we do is written down. Matthew 12, 36 says that every single word that we speak, we'll give an account for. Psalm 139, 2 says that every thought we think, he's made a record of. Which means the things we've done, the words we've spoken, even the thoughts that we've thought have stacked up a balance due between us and God. Every word we spoke, every website we visited, every obsession over how we look, every gossip-filled conversation, Every flirtatious thing we did or said to someone that wasn't our husband or wife. Every self-sabotaging thought or self-centered decision. They've mounted a debt that we cannot pay. And I tell you this because if I can help you with any one thing today, it's to change the way that you see your debt. Because you'll never forgive until you see yourself as a a debtor, a billion dollar sized debtor between you and Jesus. Let's move on to verse 26. But the man fell down before his master and he begged him, please be patient with me. And I love these words. Read the, read the, and what, and what? I mean, I mean, imagine the king. Really, dude? One talent is 20 years of wage. You have 10,000 of those. If you took your whole wage, didn't spend a dime on it, it'd take you 200,000 years. There's not enough like, like cardio and healthy living that you can do to make it 200,000 years. But this guy thinks that I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And the problem is when he says, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, you and I should have said, well, we know how he's going to forgive But he thinks he can, and because he thinks he can, he doesn't realize the gravity of what he's been forgiven from, so he can't forgive other people. We already read that part. No, you cannot forgive yourself. You cannot satisfy that debt. The only way that debt's going to be satisfied is if the king makes it okay. I'll say it again. The relationship with how you see yourself as a debtor is directly proportional to who you are as a forgiver, which brings us to the first of four points that I'm going to move through quickly. First, you owe more than you could ever repay. And I just need you to know that today. I need, I need that to hit different today. You owe more than you could ever repay. Verse 27, then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. Two things I noticed in this verse of scripture. The first is that the master was filled with pity. The Greek word there can also be translated as filled with compassion. And I like the word compassion. For me, compassion is like a, it's it's got a physiological uh, kind of posture to it as well. We've read in scripture that, that Jesus was moved with compassion. Compassion is what, why we have 
Compassion International kids sponsored, and it's why we give to things and we see the images and the pictures because it moves us and we feel something and feeling something moves us to action. It's what happened to that dad and the prodigal son is the, the, the kid's running home. He's, he's coming home with his head hung low. He knows he blew it. He basically said to his dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance. And, and so now he's making his way back. He's got a speech set up that's going to, maybe he can be a servant. But the dad sees him from afar, is filled with compassion, and takes off towards him. Compassion changes things. And Jesus was moved with compassion for you and for me, just as this king was moved with compassion for the dead. And we see a second thing, though. The second thing is that the master forgave the debt. The master forgave the debt. The king forgave the debt, which is important because only the person who you owe the, the money to, you owe the debt to, can be the one who says you're forgiven. I can't send a little sticky note in my smud bill and say my mom said I don't have to pay. <laughs> I asked Bill. Bill said, don't worry about your PG&E bill this month. No, only the person that I owe the money to can say, you're forgiven. And when we see the master, the king, decided to settle this debt, here's what he's saying. What he's saying is that in the treasury of this kingdom, there are enough resources that I can put on your debt to satisfy it. You can't do it, but I have the resources to be able to do it. And friend, hear me say that God said in the kingdom of heaven, there is a treasury. And in that treasury is one whose name is Jesus. And I can take the person of Jesus and I can put him on your debt. And that debt can be satisfied today. He forgave everything. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. You're going to see a very demonstrative word on this screen. So when you get there, everybody say it. Don't say it cute. Don't golf clap this thing. I mean, say this thing. Ready? He forgave our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. In other words, Jesus says, I can be what satisfies your debt. That brings us to our second point. You have been given more than you deserve. Yes, you owe more than you could ever repay, but thankfully through Jesus Christ, you have been given more than you could ever deserve. We've been given freedom. I mean, imagine, you know, you, you send that last payment on that car note. Woo! Right? You, you pay your last credit card off. Woo! Feels good, don't it? Like you make that last house payment. And some of y'all are like, no, that, that one will never happen. <laughs> There's something that we feel. We feel it whenever debts are satisfied. Friend, I want you to feel it today. You are free in Jesus Christ. Your debt's been satisfied. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that you've been set free. So live, leave here today living like it. John 8.36 says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So live like it. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Satisfied paid in full. The one who is whole, whose holiness is like his wholeness, that wants the relationship with us, but cannot have that relationship unless we become whole, unless we become holy. So God said in his infinite kindness and generosity, I can make you whole. Friend, you need the grace of Jesus Christ to be in you and on you and around you and before you and behind you and beside you if it's ever going to come through you. How is the grace of Jesus ever going to come through us unless we experience it and know that it's, I'm just swimming as the song says, <laughs> grace is an ocean, I'm sinking. Live like that, live with that understanding and we'll find that grace will begin to flow through us as well. Verse 28, as we keep going, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. A few thousand dollars. Let's use the same math that we used before. Maybe your Bible says a hundred denarii. So one denarius is roughly a single day's wage. So got to keep in mind, modern day figures, we're estimating $12 billion is what, what the, 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 the servant actually owed. 
But he, he was owed by, from someone else, he was owed 100 denarii. So one denarius is roughly a day's wage. So if we take you know, the, what, what basically you make in one day, and I got it by going 52 weeks out of the year, it's five days a week, so there's 260 working days a year. So $60,000 was that median income that we're looking at divided by how many working days a year equals $230 a day. So $230 is one denarius. He, owed, he was owed 100 denarius. So $230 times 100 he was owed twenty-three thousand dollars modern-day money compared to the twelve billion-dollar debt that he had, and he couldn't forgive twenty-three thousand dollars. Though his debt was completely satisfied, I promise you that regardless what has been done to you, as heinous and heartbreaking as it is, friend, it's not greater than what you and I have done to Jesus. And the servant that owed money to this guy. He, he didn't belittle the debt. He wasn't, he wasn't flipping about the debt that he owed. In fact, he had the same exact posture as the first servant did. Let's read it together. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. Doesn't that sound familiar? But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. And some of the other servants saw this. They were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man who had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Of course, the centerpiece of today's message, shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Do you see that intersection? There's like a juxtaposition there. And I believe what's happening here is that it's breaking down the way that we typically extend forgiveness. We, we typically distribute forgiveness based on things like a person's worth to us. Are they remorseful or not? How do we feel about what they've done and about the process so far? We'll tend to distribute based on things like the damage that was done. And Jesus is saying that when forgiveness needs to be extended He's saying, don't look at the conflict. Don't look even at the character of the person. Because the forgiveness that we're talking about today is not an external effort. It's an internal work. So Jesus is saying, I believe through this parable, he's saying, don't look at the conflict. Don't even look at the character of the person. The only way we can see forgiveness that we're about to distribute is through the lens of the cross. That we can only distribute forgiveness if we see it through the lens of what has happened to us to satisfy our debt. It brings us to the third point. Forgive according to what's been done for us what, rather than what they deserve. There's a, that's the principle. The capacity for grace is only truly found when we consider the cross. You know, brokenness has hardwired us for revenge. You can't do that to me. So listen, I, it doesn't matter. Maybe you're the kind of person, we all have natural bends and wirings. We're all better at different things and maybe the person on the other side of us. But So you might be naturally more inclined to not hold a grudge. That may be the way that you're wired. But for all of us, no matter your natural wiring or not, if we're ever going to untangle our, our propensity towards, towards just revenge and and you can't do that to me. We're never going to be able to do it unless we do it through the lens of grace. I want to close today. Let's, let's, let's finish off this passage of Scripture that Jesus used as a teaching example to talk about forgiveness. Verse 34, then the king, the angry king, sent the man to prison to be, what's that word? Until he had paid his entire debt. And then Jesus closes with that verse we've been talking about today. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. What, what in the world does this mean for, for us? Two things. There's an earthly consequence and there's an eternal consequence that I want to just close with. The earthly consequence is that when you uh, harbor bitterness or anger or, and you withhold forgiveness, friend, it will torture you. That thing that that 
servant refused to let go of is ultimately what got him thrown into prison and tortured. And let me tell you that when you refuse forgiveness to someone, you're doing a work inside of you. You're the one that's truly suffering. You're the one that's truly being tortured. Like I, we've all heard, maybe you've heard it said, I, I, I couldn't even find who to actually credit it to because like it, so many people have said it. I, I found one person that said it was John Ortberg. Bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. <laughs> Bitterness is eating rat poisoning, hoping that they get sick. You are the only one suffering. Listen to this. In addition to that reality that we've all experienced at some level, bitterness and unforgiveness increases your level of stress, increases the level of depression, increases level of anxiety, increases your blood pressure, lowers your immune system, and increases your propensity towards getting sick, and increases the likelihood of substance abuse. Not forgiving, not extending grace is torturing you. But that's the earthly consequence. There's an eternal consequence with an even greater implication, and that is this. If you are unwilling to forgive, Jesus says, you don't know him. If you're unwilling to forgive, you don't know Jesus. And I, I would say it like this as a way that we can maybe remember. An unforgiving heart reveals an unforgiven heart. An unforgiving heart just surfaces that we don't really understand what we've been forgiven of. Is Jesus saying, if you don't forgive me, I'm sending you to hell? Of course not. Is Jesus saying, you can earn your way to heaven by being a top forgiver? No. He's saying that grace changes me. And grace changes you. And so if you've not experienced the grace of Jesus, you won't extend it. If you've shortchanged, understated the work of grace in your life, you'll never be able to extend it. I'll ask this question. Is there a way you see God, a belief you have in how God sees you, or an offense you have against someone else that is keeping you from truly experiencing the grace that has been lavished on you? Because if you get that, and we'll learn how to extend the grace through us. So what do we do? Well, first, we just remember what was done for us. And secondly, we consider who in our life do we need to reconsider what's happening in our hearts. Listen, my work today has not been reconciliation. Reconciliation, many times, is a byproduct of forgiveness. But my work today has not been on the work of reconciliation. That would be another message for a different time. This has been about the work inside of you towards others. So three things to remember about forgiveness, and we're going to sing a song. First, forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. You can forgive somebody, and the relationship can still need a lot of work because forgiveness happens in you. Secondly, if it all, if it feels impossible to forgive, that's because it is, except through Jesus. Think of that verse that most of us know, I can do, I can do what I need to do. I can do all things through Christ. He, through Christ, he, he gives me the strength. He gives me the grace. He reveals compassion that moves me to action. And thirdly, all we need to know about forgiveness has already been modeled to us in Christ, which means there's more to the story than just my mistakes. And if there's more to my story than just my mistakes, there needs to be more to their story than just their mistakes. My past doesn't define me. Grace has been lavished on me. And so I need to create the space for that in others. My forgiveness didn't wait for me to initiate it. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't wait for you to chase him? He just met us. So we've seen that modeled by Jesus. That's how we can model it. Forgiveness wasn't and isn't an equitable agreement between me and Jesus. Jesus didn't wait to like the terms that I gave him. He said, I forgive you. Forgiveness left room for my brokenness in the process that I'm still in. 
And likewise, our forgiveness to others needs to do the same. I like this. I desperately needed forgiveness, and it made all the difference in me. And maybe, maybe there's someone that we need to begin to do a work in that would extend forgiveness, and maybe that's all the difference, and it'll make all the difference in them. We're going to sing. It's, I, 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 Steve probably hates it because I keep saying, can we close with the song Abandoned? <laughs> but the, it really, it's just, there's just something that happens when we sing like we really mean it, like I'm, I'm all in. I'm, 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 I'm completely abandoned to you, Jesus. So much in our life begins to change when we get better at the work of surrender. And so a song like this gives ourselves to the work of Jesus. When we give ourselves to the work of Jesus, we will find that the work of Jesus comes through us as well. Let me pray for you. God, I pray that a message like this, I, 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 I get it. Um, it's, there's, there's relationships that surface. There's hurt that surfaces. There's, oh, it's, just, it's, it's a very triggering kind of conversation. But, Father, the work, my job today wasn't to talk about how do relationships heal. My job today was to ask that you would shift the insides of hearts, that, God, you would bring relief to people that have substituted bitterness or a grudge for the the miraculous work of forgiveness that you can show us how to do, that you can begin to release the grip of bitterness that's taken a root and inside of us and you can begin to pry our fingers off of it but you're you're prying our fingers off of it not not to hurt us you're saying no 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 no. trust me trust me trust me i will do the work through you i will extend the grace through you i will show you how to what, what forgiveness looks like and so i pray that we would learn to trust the work of forgiveness that you're doing in us so that we can give ourselves away to the work of forgiveness that you want to do through us. Change some hearts today. May today be the beginning of some phone calls or some texts or some just some decisions that are made inside of us, absent from the work in the relationship, but some decisions that say, for me, today and this moment, I'm letting it go and I'm giving it to Jesus. It's that James passage that I love. I release what I am concerned about and I receive that you are concerned concerned about me, giving our anxieties to you, giving our cares to you. May we release what we are bitter about, release what we are stressed about, and give way to the work and say, I accept what you've done for me and believe that you will do a great work of forgiveness through me. We pray this, needing the Spirit of Jesus for every step of the process. In Jesus' name.